Hello and welcome to TidyX episode 141. TidyX is a screencast where we go through and explain how our code works. My name's Ellis Hughes. And my name is Patrick Ward. Thanks for checking out TidyX. As always, if you're super into what we're doing, like and subscribe on that YouTube channel. Drop your comments, questions below. At the end of this episode, we're going to say, hey, what else would you want to know? That's a great place That's to do it. That's where we want to know. Exactly. That's where we want to know, <laughs> what you want to know. And uh, yes. on top of that, um, if you feel like our work has somehow positively impacted your work and you'd like to make a donation to our efforts, our Patreon page is always open. That said, we're going to jump into episode 141 based on a question that someone left on YouTube coming out of the previous episode where we built some functions. And Ellis talked a little bit about function factories and someone said, function factories, that sounds cool. What is it? And so we're going to give a kind of high level overview of function factories. And then if you have something that you're interested in uh, kind of tackling with these things and you leave it on the YouTube channel, we can use it in the next episode and go a little deeper into function factories. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Thank you for the, the comments and questions in the last several episodes. It's been fun to hear back what you guys have or have not liked about what we've been doing here. Uh, so, all right, so let's get going with function factories. So first we're going to load a couple libraries for us to use, tidyverse and scales. And now mm -hmm. let's talk about what is a function factory. So a function factory is a function that returns another function. So it's it's churning out functions, hence it's being a, a function factory. So this is a pretty common concept in uh, programming in general. Um, it, it's not just like some crazy thing that Alice is like, hey, I'm going to do this thing and return a return a function. You've never seen that before. No, I'm not that creative. Uh, so there's actually a really great ex in-depth explanation. Uh, it, very good in-depth, but also very introductory level um, explanation from in advanced R chapter 10 called Function Factories by Hadley Wickham. Uh, the link is right here on line nine. So definitely go check that out if this is something that you're intrigued by and want to learn a little bit more about. But I wanted to start off by saying like function factories kind of exist everywhere, as I was saying before. You're actually going to see a number of them included in base R. So if you've ever seen the approx func um, in uh, R, so where you pass basically um, a bunch of X and Y values and um, there's a couple other arguments to it as well. What that's going to do is then provide you a function for then you can provide an X value and it'll predict what that Y value will be. It's not exactly like, um, like predict from LM. It's just, a, it's a little bit different, but the idea is that you're providing some preset values and you're going to have it derive whatever con whatever contents, and then it's going to spit back a function that you're able to add new values into, and based off of the values that you'd provided before, it'll calculate new things for you. Um, so this is this is really nice because then you can have some predefined function that whenever you want to have it predict, you don't have to pass that model into it. It's going to have that model baked into that function already. So uh, a, there's a couple other examples of this. So the one that I see most regularly is from the uh, GR devices package, which is included, you know, in, in, in R, uh, where there's a function called color ramp palette. And what that allows you to do is pass a vector of uh, colors. So they need to be valid colors. So either hex or just their, their name here. And when you pass that, it kind of doesn't do anything exciting. It's going to return this new function to you, but that new function has some really interesting capabilities. So what it's going to do is you can pass an integer into it. And what it does is then it's going to generate n number of values that are representing a gradient between those four or however many colors you passed into color ramp palette. And so we can use the show call function from scales to then demonstrate this is just 10. 20, 100, but it, it, it makes this nice gradient for you. So if you're trying to do a, a, a linear gradient between values, this is going, this is like a great way to, to start with. Obviously, a lot of these other palette uh, packages have done a, a good job of trying to deal with the color side and, and, and that, that sort of side of the world. But I wanted to demonstrate like this is like a really powerful tool that you can use to set some defaults and then just use going forward. Um, and so that 
Base R is not the only place this appears. This also appears in ggplot too. Patrick, do you want to take us through that yeah. a little bit? Yeah, let's look at where else we might use function uh, function factories and not even know it. So first, uh, we'll just build a simple little data frame here. So uh, there you go. We have X is, is a constant, and then Y is an increasing value. Uh, that's just to be able to extract out the numbers that we can then plot. And what you'll see is on line 28 and 29, uh, everything above that's just our standard ggplot fair. We're just going to plot some points. Uh, but that scale y continuous uh, is basically saying, hey, this is we, how we want the y axis to behave. And within that, you can pass things like, what are the labels that I want? What are the limits that I want? Those, those kinds of things. In this case, we're going to pass some labels. And you've probably done this if you've done enough plotting. You might want, you know, you, you can see from our data frame that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it's kind of hairy to read a bit. So throwing in some commas there might be really useful. If it was money, we might use dollar format. If it was percentages, we might use percent format. These are functions from the scales uh, package, which allows us to pass labels that are meaningful for the number the, the numbers within our plots. And so we're going to use this comma format function factory. And the reason why it's a function factory is that it will take the arguments that you place in there and you then go ahead and chew out a function and apply them to those y variables. So here we have no arguments set. We're just going to run this. And we'll see, okay, cool, there we go. It gives us some uh, uh, the commas that we uh, expect to see. So every third, every three numbers, there's a comma, great. Um, but now let's go ahead and uh, beef this up a little bit by applying some functions within the function. So we're gonna run our function factory here. So some of the arguments you can apply are the scale. So let's say our data is meaningful to the, uh, what is that, the 10 hundreds thousandth a uh, uh, decimal point, three decimal points out. And let's say we also, maybe we're talking in dollars or something, but let's say the suffix is K. So we'll put a K at the end of it. And we can put a prefix and the dollar sign and we can go ahead and we can run this. Just because you said money. I was like, okay, yeah, I gotta add in the dollar sign. So there, <laughs> there we go. So now we have our data uh, spit out and the function factory basically ran and then applied those arguments all the way down uh, through it. So we could we could see it here if we run uh, comma format here, we see the way the function is written. And it, it um, returns a function specifically. So yep. And then if, 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 we, if it was just the function, it would have returned just values, right? But yeah. in this case, it returned a function that we can use later on. Yep. And then if we pass that with the dfy, so the y variable, we basically see what we uh, ended up seeing on our um, on our plot, and then if we pass it with our um, our arguments, uh, we get the same type of deal that we saw on the plot. And so now let's take these function factories that you probably use and don't even know it, and just go over last week's example with this in mind, and it might make a little bit more uh, concrete sense. So yeah. The, the, let's go through that. Um, so if you haven't seen it, check out episode 139. You can go to bit.ly slash tidy X episode 139 to check that out. Stop right now and go watch it. <laughs> uh, but let's take some fake data here. Um, this is the same data that we used in episode 139, where we've got some years here and then some random values that we generated. Um, what we were trying to do is calculate Z scores in episode 139, but we had some years that we didn't want to use as reference in order to calculate the Z score. We wanted to use every year that was before 2023 as our reference to then apply to the entire data set. So based on the response of episode 139, that seems like something that people have seen a fair amount is you just get this whole whole big data set and maybe you don't wanna go through the, the effort of splitting it up into your pre and then the full data set. So the way you go about doing this and the way that I showed that we could do this for calculating the Z-score and then using it as a function factory is we have the gen Z-score function here. We have dat var meaning the var that we plan on calculating uh the z-score on in this situation there's just value but um i think in the last situation that we applied it to it had value one value two value three 
could be X, Y, Z, it could be whatever, whatever column you want to apply it to. And then rows in the situation it was identifying out of DAT, which rows are we going to be calculating this over? Um, and so the, the standard is going to be DAT year less than 2023. We, we calculate the A and S. So A is the average. We're going to use the mean function. We're going to pull out var, and then we're going to subset that to have only the rows that we care about. And ARM equals true, so, so that it doesn't uh, include NAs when it's calculating mean. Same idea for standard deviation. And then we go and return, generate this function. And this function accepts a single argument x, which is going to be a vector that we're going to calculate the z-score on. And mm -hmm. we're going to subtract a and divide by s and return z, and then eventually return that from this function. But importantly, a and s aren't recalculated every time this function is run. They're already calculated in the environment that this, this guy lives in now. And so this mm -hmm. is just going to reference those values going forward. So let's let's go through and inspect this and see what's going on here. So let's generate the, the z-score value func here from the gen z-score func, calculating on dat, across value, any cases where a year is less than 2023. So let's print out z-score value just to see what it looks like. So like in the future when you're looking at contents to, to, to be able to identify function factories, you can see that not only did it return that, that core function, the the z-score the z calculating function, but it prints out this environment piece here, right? If it, if it was just a, a function that didn't have an environment around it, it wouldn't print the mm. environment. What? Mm. <laughs> yeah. So that, yeah. That, that might be a way to tell. Some It, it might also yeah. be like functions that are within um, other packages too might have that. Yeah. Too. So that's not yeah. always a dead giveaway, but that might be a way to look at it. Um, but it's an environment, so how can we inspect that? So you can use the environment function uh, to convert or to pull out the environment from your function. I feel like I'm saying that a lot, but now we've got z-score value n, which is the environment of that function we were looking at. And now it's just an environment. So now we can look at all the contents of that environment and pull those, pull those values out. We can use ls, which will list all the the objects inside of the environment. So here we have A, so the average that we calculated, dat, because that even though it's not used in the, the new function that we created, it still lived in the environment that it was uh, created in. Same with rows, S, so the standard deviation again, and var. So all the variables are still available technically inside mm -hmm. of this function environment. And so let's let's pull out a and s to give us the average in the standard deviation that we calculated. And this is for if this was done in our function generating factory. So we have an average of 19 and a, a standard deviation of 8.966. And we can double check that those values are correct by calculating the mean and standard deviation on the actual data set. And they match like they should because those are the values that those are the correct values, right? And so this gives you a lot of power to like expand and create functions that store information that you don't want your user to be able to necessarily change, but then take advantage of those values having already been calculated or already been provided. So they're no longer default. They can't change mm -hmm. them, but they can now use them. Yep. And this is just one example of function factories. You're going to, if you read the, the, uh, chapter there. There's a lot of different ways Hadley talks about uh, function factories, kind of goes through this whole environment breakdown of, of how they live and, and where where objects exist. So it's actually really interesting. I definitely suggest you take a look at it if you stuck around for this long. Um, but, you know, this is just uh, to give you an introduction to function factories. Uh, please let us know if there's something else you would like to know about function factories. Mm -hmm. um, because it can be a very complicated and very convoluted topic, I wanted to make this episode very specific to um, introducing the ideas. So Patrick, do you have anything else you'd like to bring up? No, that's it. Just, um, yeah, let us know if there's other stuff or, or areas where you feel like a function factory would be something that you'd want to use, but you're unsure of how to get it started. Yeah, exactly. And with that, 
we're going to call it on episode 141. Thank you all for joining us for so many episodes. My name is Ellis Hughes. You can find me on many social media sites uh, mm-hmm. under the name Ellis underscore Hughes. And my name is Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick at tidy underscore explained is where we both are. Tidy dot explained at gmail.com is where you can email us. As we've said a few times, like and subscribe on the YouTube channel and drop the questions and comments. That's usually the best way to get in touch with us and get your question heard and answered in the next episode. And as always, if you feel like our work has positively impacted yours and you want to donate, to our Patreon page. Uh, it's there, and we are appreciative of anything that you would like to give. Thank you all so much, and keep on exploring your world.